Hello students, today we're going to talk about vector addition. I've split this up into two parts. In part one I'm going to talk about some of the basics of vector addition. In part two I'll go through an example. The goal for today is to talk about adding vectors pictorially. We're also going to learn how to subtract vectors and then I'm going to talk about something that I call the global angle. Let's take a look at some vectors here. Remember a vector is defined by having a magnitude and a direction. I'm going to go ahead and label these up as vectors A, B, and C and let's add them together. To do this there's an important rule that we must remember. When you add vectors you must always place the head of one vector on the tail of another vector. I can always pick up a vector and move it so that I can position it so that the head of one is on the tail of another, but you must remember you cannot change the length of the vector or the direction the vector is pointing, otherwise you've changed the properties of the vector itself. Just so everybody's on the same page, here's the tail and the head of a vector. We say the head is always the arrow point. This is what it looks like to add vectors head to tail, and you can see that the head of one vector is on the tail of another. I'm showing two examples of this. If you are trying to add the two vectors together, then you cannot have the head of one vector touch the head of another, or you cannot have a tail touch another tail. Let's go back to these three vectors we had and let's start adding them together. I'm going to go with A plus B plus C is equal to R. I'm using R as the resultant. We're going to define that in just a moment. Here's vector A. I'm going to place it down. I'm going to move vector B down head to tail. Now I'm going to place the tail of C onto the head of B. It doesn't matter that they cross like that. This is me adding A plus B plus C. The solution to this is the green vector. The way that I find this is I start at the beginning of my blue vectors, the ones that I'm adding, and I just trace the path and I go all the way until the end. Start at the backmost position of the blue vectors, then take the shortest straight line path to get to the end of the trail. That is our resultant vector. I'm showing it in green. It is just another vector. I could pick it up and move it across the page too if I wanted. Okay, now I'm shifting things around a little bit. I've moved that same A plus B plus C addition to the top left. Let's look at what happens when we add these vectors in a different order. This time I'm going to add B, then I'm going to place C, then I'm going to place A. This equals R. Again, to find that green vector, what I would do is I would start at the backmost point of my blue vectors and take a straight line path to the end of the trail. It's going to look something like that. I could add C plus A plus B. It would look like this. Again, there's my resultant vector. I could do another option. This time I'm doing A plus C plus B. And again, I get the green resultant vector. If you didn't notice this before, you can see here that all of these vectors are actually the same. This brings up a property of vector addition. Just like in arithmetic, we can say that A plus B is equal to B plus A. That's the commutative property. This is also true for vectors. The A vector plus the B vector is equal to the B vector plus the A vector. I also want to go back to these very quickly just to show you something. Remember that I said you can never have the head of one vector touching the head of another vector. That only applies for vectors that you're actually adding together. So to show you what I mean, notice that in this location, for example, I have a green headed vector touching the blue headed vector over here. But remember, it's only the blue vectors that are being added. So I'm adding a blue plus a blue plus a blue to get the green resultant. The resultant vector can have a head touching another head. Or back here you can even see the tail of the resultant touching the tail of one of my original vectors. In fact, that'll happen every time by requirement. Let's move on and look at another property of vectors. I put my three vectors here again, A, B, and C. If I want to see what the negative of these vectors looks like, I can show that here. Notice that I have maintained the length of each vector and all I have done is change the direction that the arrow is pointing. They now point in the opposite direction of what they originally did. Or another way to say this is that I've changed their direction by 180 degrees. 
This is an important property of vectors because we can make use of it when we want to do vector subtraction. Remember that with arithmetic, if I have a minus b, that is the same thing as saying a plus minus b. Same is going to be true for our vectors. If I have vector a minus vector b, one way that I can do this is I can say vector a plus the negative b vector. For this situation, if I were to do this vector subtraction, I would have a plus the negative b vector, pick up the negative b, move it head to tail, then again use my same trick to find the resultant vector, which looks like this, and I could pick that vector up and move it around however I wish. Moving on, this is what a vector might look like for us. We might describe the magnitude with something like 6.3 meters, and then I can give a direction. Sometimes I might say that direction is 22 degrees, perhaps from the horizontal, maybe I'm launching something. If I'm looking at a map, maybe I could say that wind is traveling 1.7 meters per second, 28 degrees west of south. That could just be a different way to give a direction. It's convenient for physicists and mathematicians to have some sort of normal way to measure our angles. I call this the global angle. I'm sure there are other names for it. But for it to work, we just pick some criteria that everybody can agree on. We say that we always measure from the east position, or if I were using Cartesian coordinates, that would be the positive x. That is our zero degrees. That's our reference. We will say that angles always increase in the counterclockwise direction. Lastly, we will say that angles typically vary between 0 and 360 degrees. I say typically because you will certainly occasionally see people make a, an angle measurement of, say, negative 10 degrees. That's not too difficult to handle, but I'm going to pass over that in this particular presentation. For us, we're going to say that a negative 10 degrees would be the same thing as a 350 degree angle. If I look at the first vector that I gave as an example, I can see that that 22 degrees there is actually already being measured from east. And so this vector is unchanged. I would say it is 6.3 meters at 22 degrees. In fact, I could even drop out the from horizontal. With this vector that I said was 28 degrees west of east, I'm going to map this grid over it so that we can see 0 degrees is to the east. North is 90, and then of course you can see 180 and 270 degrees as well. Sometimes we will talk about the quadrants to which a vector is pointing. It's the same as it is in Cartesian coordinates and mathematics. The top right quadrant is quadrant 1, and then it moves around in a counterclockwise motion as well. With this in mind, I can say that my vector is pointing towards the third quadrant, so right away I know that it must have a global angle between 180 and 270 degrees. What I need to do is I need to look at the 28 degree interior angle and figure out how I would represent that if I reference from zero degrees from east. Remember that I'm going to increase my angle as I move counterclockwise. The answer for this particular vector is 242 degrees. The way that I arrive at that is I can say that if I have 242 degrees to get me to my vector and then I move an additional 28 degrees, that should get me to my pointing downward or south 270. So I'm just using some addition and subtraction here to say that 270, which is downward, minus the 28 is going to be equal to the 242 that I'm using as my global angle. I'm going to flop this around just on the other side so that we can take a slightly different perspective. This is now a different vector. It's a quadrant 4 vector. It has to be between 270 and 360, which I have labeled as 0 there. In this case, I have to move the full 270 degrees just to get down to that vertical point, but I have to move an additional 28, and so I'm going to this time add 28 to my 270 to find that my global angle for this vector is 298 degrees. We'll just do another quick example. If I had a vector that's up in the second quadrant, I can take a peek at this. Now, if I'm given the direction of a vector, I'm, I might be given one of these two angles, and you just have to pay attention to which one you're given. 
remember that the two angles must add up to 90 degrees. So you can always work with whichever angle you're given. If I started with 33 degrees measured as I've indicated there and I needed to come up with my global angle. In this case I would say that I have to go from 0 to 180 degrees to get to that leftward pointing west direction but then I have to backtrack that known 33 degrees so that's minus 33 to get to my 147 degrees for the global angle. If I were given that 57 degree angle to begin with this time it's more useful for me to say I'm gonna go from 0 to 90 so I'm already at 90 degrees and then I have to travel an additional 57 degrees to get to my angle which again should come out to be 147 degrees. If done correctly this vector needs to always register a 147 degree global angle no matter what information you're given. Let's summarize what we've said. First, vectors can be added head to tail in any order, does not matter what order they are added. Remember it's only the vectors that are being added together that must fit head to tail. It's okay if you see the head of a resultant vector touching the head of a vector th that was involved in the addition. If the negative of a vector is just the same vector except pointing in the opposite direction. Keep the magnitude the same but just add or subtract 180 degrees from the vector and you have its negative. That's very useful when you want to do vector subtraction. Lastly, global angles are measured from the east and they increase in angle as you move counterclockwise. We really just use these so that people are on the same page. This way I could say the vector is 3 meters at 123 degrees and somebody could understand what I mean by that, how I'm getting that angle. That's it for this video. I'm going to do an example problem in Vector Edition Part 2, but as usual, as far as this information goes, if you think you've got it, let your computer know.